What's going on people? Welcome back to my personal channel. Welcome back to another video for you guys today. In this video, we're going to be discussing five things we learned from Manchester United nil, Chelsea nil. This is a show where we're going to go through five big talking points of the last Chelsea match. And we're going to discuss how this impacts Frank Lampard and Chelsea going forward into our next match against Krasnodar. Before I start this video, if you guys haven't done so already, smash that like button, hit the subscribe button as well, and press that bell notification button as well to be the first guy to know whenever we release any new content. And yeah, let's go straight into the video. Five things we learned from Manchester United nil, Chelsea nil. Let's go. First talking point, and we're going to go on a positive because we know Frank Lampard suffered a lot of criticism over the last couple weeks. I'm not Frank Lampard out, I'm still Frank Lampard in. And with that in mind, I do want to start on a positive because he has had a lot of criticism. We do need to give Frank Lampard a lot of praise as well. Two clean sheets in a week, you know. Two clean sheets. I, I mean, I get Edouard Mendy's a big factor for it. And the same thing as Thiago Silva. But imagine saying that a few weeks ago. Like, about a year ago, we've been having less clean sheets in a hostel in Amsterdam. And now we're seeing two clean sheets in the space of a week. Say what you want about how poor the attacking quality was or how bad we were in transition, but defensively we were solid. And we were saying Frank Lampard needed to sh needs to fix up this Chelsea defence. Now we've seen two clean sheets in two games. And yes, playing that five at the back, that was mainly put out there to try and minimise the defensive mistakes because as we know from previous experience, it's been individual mistakes that have been the biggest issue for Chelsea this season. Even looking past the goalkeeper situation or the Kepa tax or anything like that, the biggest issue that we've had this season is individual mistakes. And playing five at the back, was an example of trying to minimise those individual mistakes. And from a defensive point of view, it worked. Rhys James kept Marcus Rashford in his back pocket. And going forward as well was absolutely excellent. His crosses have been disrespected by whoever's been on the end of it for months now. And as soon as we get someone fit and firing on the end of these crosses, Rhys James can finally get the assist that he's been deserving for a long time. Thiago Silva as well, passing out the back was excellent. Later on in the game as well, did a great job of keeping Edson Cavani quiet. There was two big chances where if it weren't Thiago Silva there, that's 1-0 for Chelsea. Edison, and he knows Edson Cavani really well and he used that to his perfect effect for him today as well. Kurt Zuma and Asper Equator came out with some amazing blocks and challenges during the match. Again, the main thing to do is try and minimise the errors. That's especially from Kurt Zuma's point of view. Because most of the mistakes have been coming from Kurt Zuma over the last week. The last game he was saved by Ben Chilwell. The Southampton game, not so lucky. And if anything, I think that's coming to, it, to his head has impacted his recent performances as well. Because I don't think Kurt Zuma's a poor defender. I think he's had an amazing season before the Southampton game. I just think it's stuck to his head a little bit more. So it's good to play five at the back and to have more players around him while he tries to build his confidence back up. But Zuma and Azpilicueta had quality games as well. Ben Chilwell was also amazing defensively. Didn't really see him do much going forward until the second half where we were really trying to overload the wings. But defensively he was amazing and he kept that left hand side on lock. And there's a reason why Manchester United spend most of their time trying to create attacks down Reese James's side because they just weren't getting through on the left. Not to say that they were getting through on the right hand side either. If we're being real about it, both wing backs were excellent yesterday. Moving on to my second point and I want to talk about the balance because over the first few games of the season it was obvious our attack was doing excellent but our defence was letting us down. And now over the last week it's been our defence has been doing well but now it's come at the, ben at the loss of our attacking quality. And if you look at this game, it was a massive example out of it. The further we went up the pitch, the weaker we were as a team. And Kai Havertz, Christian Pulisic and Timo Werner were left isolated up front. Christian Pulisic had the best performance out of the three, if we're being honest about it. He did find a lot of space on that right-hand right hand side. And he unleashed a couple of shots in that goal, but it was never anything too threatening. He also had the best chance possible out of a Reese James cross, where he was just inches away from getting a touch on it, and that would have been 1-0. But... He had the best performance out of the three. The, the most I'm going to hold him back for is that I think he could have linked up with Timo Werner. And I think the same way goes the other way around as well. Timo Werner was working hard trying to find chances or find space or create space or make runs to try and create opportunities for himself. But no one fed him. No one fed him. And you could see in the second half how frustrated he was getting. 
Whenever he got on the ball, he was holding onto it for too long, trying to create something out of it, just out of frustration because he hadn't seen enough of the ball for a long period of time. And that's why I think he was starting to miss out on Christian Pulisic as well, because there were periods where Christian Pulisic was free on the right-hand side, and Timo Werner could have passed to him. But he had his head down, he was trying to do too much, he was trying to beat too many players, and the ball was lost and it was turned over. Um, Kai Havertz as well. If anything, I think he was the most invisible one out of the lot today. You barely saw him on that right-hand side for the entire first half. He started to come more and more into the game as he's tried to come further and further towards the centre of the pitch. But overall, it was a massively frustrating game for him and he had barely Im any impact throughout the match. All that does is just cement my belief that we, especially in this early period where he's trying to gel to Premier League football, we got to be playing him in his best position. And his best position is at the 10 behind Timo Werner. I don't hold it against Frank Lampard for trying it out. Five at the back was the formation that we used to beat Manchester United in the semi-final. And Kai Havertz is still a very versatile player. There's no reason why in a couple of months time where he's adjusted to Frank Lampard's style a bit style play a bit more there's no reason why we can't play him back in that position again but for, t for today it didn't work uh, Kai Havertz was just isolated throughout the entire attack it was just poor Manchester United's defense had a very easy job trying to snuff out our attack but why was our defense so good and why was our attack so poor I think we both know the answer for it I'm just leading on to my third point right now Third point, and we're going to talk about the midfield because it's obvious if defence was doing banging and the attack was poor, the problem is in the middle. And the problem was the midfield. We were turning over so much possession in midfield. I'm going to isolate one player out for this as well, and it's N'Golo Kante. I love N'Golo Kante. I don't think he should be sold. I never thought he should be being sold. I don't even think he's dusted or anything like that because he had an amazing start to the season. But N'Golo Kante needs to be benched, man. This is another poor performance from N'Golo Kante. A lot of the reason why we couldn't get the ball from defence to attack was because N'Golo Kante was turning over possession so much in midfield. There was 13 dispossessions from N'Golo Kante and he killed so many transitions from defence to attack. Passing range was poor from him. He struggled to deal with the Manchester United press. And the worst part is, this isn't the first game from N'Golo Kante where we've seen this. Right now, this is the third game in a row where I'm saying N'Golo Kante had a poor performance. And this isn't, again, this isn't me trying to slay Kante or saying we should sell this guy. Even right now, I'm saying Kante is key to our team. He just needs a spell on the bench because he's off four. Start of the season, he was excellent. Brighton, he was all over Brighton. I think he had more interceptions than the entire Tottenham squad combined on their first match day. The Liverpool game as well. Potential man of the match. If anything, he probably did win man of the match for Chelsea. He was all over that Liverpool midfield. From, all, from the start of the box to the other side of the box as well. His dribbling skills are excellent. His passing skills are on point as well. So I don't know what's happened with N'Golo Kante recently. Because Southampton, it was another case of he was intercepting the ball well. But he was turning it over too many times as well. And this is half the reason why we lost the midfield battle in the second half. Uh, Sevilla as well. More the same but less of the interceptions. And it looked like it was his worst performance in a Chelsea shirt. And now this one. We're lucky we didn't lose this match because if we did, I'm sure the blame would have been placed solely on N'Golo Kante as a scapegoat. And I'm not trying to scapegoat him. I'm trying to read the game as I see it. I don't think Kante needs to be sold or anything. I don't think he's a finished player. I don't think he's no longer going to be the player that he was before. But it's clearly obvious that N'Golo Kante was not the answer for us in that game. I'm going to go on to poor game management in the fourth point because there is definitely a lot to talk about for that. I don't think N'Golo Kante should have played for the full 90 minutes. Minutes. That's where Lampard does take some of the blame, I, but I get why he started Kante originally, but Kante still had a poor performance. I don't want to see him in the in the Krasnodar match. I might not want to see him in the league game against Burnley either, unless maybe you want to take him out and try and bring him back in again. But Kante needs a rest. He's had a poor run of games over the last week. We can't keep playing him just based on name value alone. Kante has to be playing based on merit, just like the rest of the squad. Right now, he isn't justifying his place in the squad. So, third point, N'Golo Kante needs to be benched. My fourth talking point I want to go into, and this is about game management. We've talked about game management so many times with Chelsea over the last season. And yes, we are going to talk about it again. Because... 
I agree with Frank Lampard's lineup for the most part. It all made sense and we kept another clean sheet. So I'm not going to complain too much about it. But I still think this game could have been won. Take out the VAR incident. I'm not even going to talk about the VAR incident in this video. I spoke about that enough in my review. So if you want to see that, check that out as well. But we ain't going to talk about VAR. I'm going to talk about game management because regardless of how well United pressed us, regardless of how United had the majority of chances, we still had the majority of possession. And I still think this game could have been won if we managed the game better. But we did not manage the game better. First point. This game was screaming, literally screaming for Mateo Kovacic to join the pitch. And he didn't even come off the bench. Why? I don't get that. N'Golo Kante was not working. We've already spoken about it in this video, so I ain't going to slay him too much. But N'Golo Kante wasn't working. Anyone in their nan could have seen that. Why didn't we bring on Kovacic, the most impressible guy in our midfield? The guy who could probably break the Manchester United press. Because that's half the reason why we were struggling to find the attack. Because United were pressing us too strongly. Why didn't we bring on Mateo Kovacic? Were we resting him for Krasnodar? We don't even need to do him for that. We could have brought him off the bench for half an hour and started him in the next game as well. He hasn't started in over a week. So I didn't get that. My second point... Towards the second half, we started forcing a lot of crosses from the wings, from Reese James and from Ben Chilwell as well. So why was the best target man and the best header of a ball that we have in our squad on the bench? And yet again, still didn't come on. When we end up making subs, which was after the 70th minute again, which was again annoying because Antonio Conte did the same damn thing for ages. And, no, and we all slated him for it. I love Lampard. These substitutions need to come earlier. We can see what changes need to be made, but they're not being made. Why is that? That doesn't make any sense to me. We end up bringing on Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount. Mason Mount I'm fine with. I'm going to bring on to that in my, in my later point. But Tammy Abraham didn't make any sense. I don't care how tall Tammy Abraham is. He's not good at heading. Not yet. That's an area of his game that he needs to improve at. We need to Olivier Giroud who could bully that back line, create space for himself and actually be able to compete for those headers. Olivier Giroud and Mateo Kovacic were the two substitutes that I do think we should have made and would have had a massive impact on the change of the game. Mateo Kovacic would have linked up defence to attack just like that. Same as the Sevilla match, I'm sure of it. Olivier Giroud would have had one chance in the air and that could have been the difference between 0-0 and 1-0. I'm sure of that as well. Let me know you guys' thoughts in the comment section below whether you agree or disagree with me or not and we're going to go straight into our last point. Final point and we're going to talk about Mason Mount because I'm not going to lie, it's funny that we've been saying for ages that we need to bench Mason Mount that he needs a bit more rest, he's been overplayed and it's been having an impact on his performances and it's also put a spotlight on him where people are criticising him because he's been included in the squad too many times then his performances justify. And with that in mind, I still get why he was rested, I don't have any issue with that. But Mason Mount should have seen a lot more game time and the game was also screaming for Mason Mount. All I'm saying is within hindsight, we should have rested Mason Mount for the severe match. We could have had Pulisic and hudson Doy playing. We would have had a much better output in that game. And that could have been the difference between 0-0 and 1-0 in that match as well. But if you look at the way we were playing going forward, nobody was pressing. That Manchester United midfield and defence had time, time and more time to, to unleash long balls out, to start attacks, to transition as well. We weren't pressing. If we had Mason Mount in that team, he would have pressed. If you remember when we played them in the semi-final, and we played five at the back as well. And we had Mason Mount playing as that right or left winger. I can't really remember for sure which one it was. But he was all over Manchester United's back line. And they couldn't cope with him. And I do feel like it would have been the same for this game as well. Mason Mount came on and our attack just got that much better. There was a bit more work rate. We were starting to create more chances. Did he have as much impact? Not really. I don't think he had the time for it as well. But I do think if we include him in the squad earlier, there is a good chance that we could have seen something different or something change in the attack. Like we already said, Mason Mount already was the difference in the last time we played him in the semi-final. That's the only substitution that I'm happy with Frank Lampard making because the game was screaming for more work rate from the attack. And Timo Werner wasn't pressing too much. Kai Havertz as well, he was a bit anonymous. Pulisic, he was pressing a little bit, but we still could have done with a little bit more. That's why I'm thinking we could have done with Mason Mount this game. But I am saying I'm still happy with the lineup. The only points I'm trying to make is we should have arrested Mason Mount for Sevilla because then we could have seen him play a bit more in this match. But guys... 
this is the end of five things we learned from Manchester United nil, Chelsea nil. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my thoughts down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carefree Lewis G. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Up the Chelsea.